going to do this morning, we have been reading. Are you enjoying the book of Psalms? I mean, isn't it just amazing? And if you've been reading the blog, it's even more amazing. Paula has done a beautiful, beautiful job of helping us to really get into the book of Psalms. S-A-R-I-P-E. Now, if you saw S-A-R-I-P-E and you tried to figure it out, you would probably say, of course that's not a word. Well, I wanted you to unscramble it, and the word that you would come up with would be praise. And the thing that we want to look at this morning is finding the power in praise. Because there's a very special power in praise. Now, if you look at various dictionaries, you will find many different meanings. You'll find that praise can be a noun, and it can be a verb. Some of the dictionaries say that it is an expression of warm approval, respect, and or gratitude. And then, of course, as a verb, it's that act of expressing warm approval, respect, or gratitude. We'll use it in both ways this morning, both as a noun and a verb. And we will look at finding the power of praise. Now, recently I was in Cape Town and I was teaching a course at the seminary there. And the course I was teaching was teaching strategies. And so we were in this big discussion about teachers and various teachers that they had had over the past. And I get very sad sometimes when I hear stories about certain teachers. And I don't know what kind of teachers you have had in the past. I'm going to give you two examples. I'm going to ask you, which one would you like to have as a teacher? Or if you think you're beyond school days, which one would you like your children or your grandchildren to have? And I've actually heard some teachers do both of these things. Teacher number one. Johnny, why are you doing that? That is stupid. Don't you know how to do that? Come on. Focus. Pay attention. Do that again. You can do better than that. Teacher number one. None, no teacher like that at your school. I know, right? No. Teacher number two. Johnny, I see you are working really hard, but are you struggling there a little bit? Let's see what we can do here. Well, Leah, this is good. You've done very well here. But, okay, what if you look at it from this side? Does it look different? What can you do now? Hey, that's very good. All right, keep going. I bet you can finish that in no time. I'll help you if you need it, but I bet you can do it. Which teacher would you want? Well, that's no question. No brainer. There is power in the words that we speak. And adults sometimes can give such cutting words and, and can absolutely destroy a child's desire or will to go on. Just changing a few little things to find praise. Harsh words can destroy, but praise can accomplish much more than harsh words ever can. Here is a way that I want you to think about spelling the word praise. Praise. Pouring respect an inspiration into someone else. I mean, think about your own children, think about neighbors, think about shop workers, think about co-workers, think about anybody. Instead of cutting them down, putting them down, look for ways to praise them. As we pour respect 
and inspiration into someone else, we need to practice celebrating their good qualities rather than their mistakes. And hey, we all make mistakes. We can learn from our mistakes. But we have to practice finding the good qualities, whether it's our spouse, our children, our coworkers, people that in the shops, we can try to praise instead of putting down. Praise can be powerful. Of course, I'm not talking about empty flattery. Just saying something to sound good, that won't work. But genuine expression of warm approval. While no one is perfect, no one is all bad either. Isn't that good? We can always find something to praise. Of course, some people it's easier than others. But if you work, you can always find something to praise. And praise is very biblical. You should have found that out this week as you were as you were reading the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is also called the book of praise. One Bible search, one Bible search showed, sorry, words get twisted here, that the word praise occurs over 350 times. Of those 350 times, more than 200 of them are in the book of Psalms. Praise, just like Boopy was talking about praise. The two most frequently used Hebrew words are yado and halal, to give thanks, to celebrate, or to give glory to. The noun is tol, admiration and thanksgiving. Originally, the book of Psalms in the Hebrew scriptures, was part of the writings. They had three parts. They had, had the Torah, or the law, the prophets, and the writings. Psalms was part of the writings. And in Hebrew, it was called praise. But somewhere over time, as Greek became the more prominent language, the English Bible adopted the Greek word, psalmol, meaning songs. That's because many of the psalm, psalms were meant to be sung, and they were sung using stringed instruments. However, the Hebrew word is more fitting because it is praise, a book of celebration, expressions of praise to God. But it also includes expressions of frustration. Have you seen that as you've read? Some of them, I mean, it just, like, somebody's heart is being ripped out as they talk about the frustrations, the agony. But even the Psalms that begin with the agonized words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you'll read it carefully, it ends with a praise to God. Because no matter what the situation looks like, God never changes. He is still there. So spelling praise, pouring respect and inspiration into someone else will work for all people. But let's look at another way to spell praise when it comes to God. And this is one part that I want us to specifically think about this morning. And the very first word is purposefully. Purposefully remembering about instances of the sovereign, eternal one. Purposefully remembering. A very powerful tool in our world today. We need to be purposeful in our remembering. It's so easy to just let bad times flow. It's just easy to give in, to complain, to let the hard times drag us down. Sometimes we lose the will to fight. But instead, we need to stand tall. We need to purposefully remember what God has done in the past 
so it gives us strength and courage to go on. As I said, Paula Ireland <clears throat> has been writing the blog for us, and she has, has talked about reading the Psalms out loud, hearing them, letting the expressions of the greatness of God flow through us over and over again. Jeremiah did this in Lamentations, and I referred to this a couple of weeks ago. But in the book of Lamentations, in the midst of the worst tragedy that Jeremiah could imagine, or not imagine, he said these words. First of all, in, in chapter 1, he says, My eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me. No one to restore my spirit. My children are destitute because the enemy has prevailed. And then in chapter 2, verse 11, again, he's, he talks about my eyes fail from weeping. I am in torment within. My heart is poured out on the ground because my people are destroyed, because children and infants faint in the streets of the city. From his lowly position of despair, torment, pain, he became purposeful in remembering. Go to Lamentations 3, verse 19. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet, and this is where he purposefully remembers, yet, this I call to mind. I purposefully, in spite of all of the problems, I purposefully remember, and therefore, I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. The band often sings, he's greater than our problems. He's greater than anything else. <clears throat> because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Even years and years and years and years later, the kids and I were at the beach this past week, and, and they were got to talking about the waves coming in, and, and one of the, the kids said, Coco, can we, can we make the waves stop? I said, no, only God. But don't they ever get tired? Well, you would think. But from creation, those waves have just come Come, come. They never stop. And God's compassions are new. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Therefore I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Thank you. Babu gave us an example last week from the book of Job. He too was in torment and pain, but he was purposeful in his remembering. In Job 19.25, after Job bemoans the fact that he's, his, of his sad existence, he boldly declares, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And then in Job 23.10 he says, But he knows the way I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Throughout the Psalms, David does the same thing. He purposefully remembers 
the good things of God. Many times he recalled the times that God had helped him, like when the Philistines were after him in Psalms 56, 13. These are most of the verses that we have read this week. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before, the, before God in the light of my life. Or when his companions and all those that he trusted in failed him. In chapter 55, verse 16 to 19. But I call to God and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle, from the battle raged against me. Even though many oppose me. God, who is enthroned forever, will hear them and afflict them. Men who never change their ways and have no fear of God. And then when he was being pursued by Saul, chapter 57, verse 9 to 11, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. I mean, he's running for his life. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the sky. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And then when he is hiding in the desert, Psalm 63. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of food. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I will remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. And they go on and on and on throughout the book of Psalms. What are we to remember? Well, we are to remember his great thing, his great power, his great love, his great compassion. We're to remember the things that God has done in the past that they will give us hope. Whatever our circumstances are today, we can leave those circumstances behind and remember, like Jeremiah, like Job, like David, like many others throughout the Bible, like many others before us, we can stop. Quit thinking about those things and purposefully remember the good things of God. We can rise above our difficulties and instead of wallowing in despair, we can rise by purposefully remembering what God, the sovereign, eternal one, has done for what he did in the past and what he will do for us today. I discovered the power of praise many, many, many years ago. I was struggling to learn faith and I've mentioned it here several times that my little mother was a woman of great faith. And I never had to worry about having faith because all I had to do was call her. If I needed anything, mother, pray. Uh, mother, I need this. Would you, would you pray for this? Mother, I'm in trouble. Will you pray? It didn't matter. She would pray. And I knew that God would answer she had that relationship with him, and whatever she asked him, he did it. If we children were sick, she didn't have money for the doctor. She prayed. If food that she was putting on the table didn't seem to be enough, or if guests came by, she prayed. It was always enough. She prayed. So as a young pastor's wife in our first church, I, I sort of began to feel guilty le leaning on my mother's faith. And I said, hmm, I, I think I should have my own faith. That's a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. 
be careful what you ask for. Because faith is not something you just get. Faith has to grow. And you have to have difficulties if you're going to find out what God can do. You certainly can't purchase it. It has to be planted like a seed, watered, nurtured, and allowed to grow over time. As I was in this time of waiting for this faith to grow, I was introduced to a little book. It was a brand new book, out, just out. It was by Merlin Carruthers, and it was called Power and Praise. He talked about learning to praise God instead of complaining. Hmm, what a novel situation. Even learning to praise God instead of praying for change. Again, Babu mentioned last week that when we pray and ask God for change, when do we want it? Now. Yesterday would have been better. <laughs> well, that won't quite happen. It takes time. And sometimes we want God to just quickly change our situation, calm that storm. But instead, we need to praise God for his mighty grace as he gives us strength to weather the storm. Now, if you're tempted to go out and buy the book Merlin Carruthers wrote, Power and Praise, I will caution you because Carruthers goes a step further. And he actually says that we should not only praise God in our circumstances, but we should praise God for our circumstances. I've never quite been able to go that far. I certainly agree that no matter what happens in whatever situation we're in, we can praise God. Because I know that God is greater than our circumstance. But I also know that some bad things happen because of evil that is in this world. Some bad things happen because people make wrong choices. I will not say that God certainly creates everything that happens in our life. But I know that Romans 8.28 is true, that all things, he can turn every situation for our good. Jeremiah, David, Job, all of these learn to praise God. When we praise God, it brings peace and rest for the spirit. Instead of spending hours pouring out our words in prayer, begging God to change the situation, we can just start praising him. Yes, we need to ask him for things, but after we give our request to him, then start praising him. Celebrate him. Give him honor and glory. For, and, I, and I think this is what Paul must have meant in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, when he said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, with praise, present your request to God. And I, I always heard, you know, growing up, if you grew up in the church, I'm sure you got used to hearing phrases that later you wondered, is that really Bible? Our, our grandchildren did arrive this week. Some of you noticed my smile's bigger. And, and last night, my grandson announced, did you know the Bible says that Boys are not supposed to hit girls, and girls are not supposed to. I'm going, really? The Bible says that. Well, that's what I was told. I said, well, the Bible probably teaches that principle. I know the Bible teaches that principle, but I don't think you'll find those words. Sometimes over the years, I have discovered that some of the things I heard in people say are not exactly what the Bible says. And one of those phrases I always heard was, God inhabits the praises of his people. I have tried to find that verse. 
I mean, I like the idea, but I can't find the verse. I have looked in every version. I've looked under every kind of combination. I cannot find it anywhere. I did find a verse that maybe they used. I don't know. It's from Psalms 23. And that's not, it can't be Psalms 23. Somewhere there's a misprint. Nope, now you're going to have to find it. In Psalms it says, He who inhabits the praises of Israel. And, and the reason I don't like the idea is because, well, if he inhabits the praises of the people, does that mean that if there are no praises, that he doesn't, he's not there? No, no, no. God is always there. God is everywhere. But he, we draw near to him. We are closer to him when we praise him. God does not need our praises in order to exist. Uh, it's 22, verse 3, instead of 23, verse 2. I'm picking up your habits. Psalms 50 lets us know that he doesn't need us. It's we who need him. He doesn't need our praises. It's us that need to praise him. Why? Because when we praise him, we draw closer to him. It wipes out the circumstances that we are in. At least focuses our attention on him. Praising him reminds us of all the good things he has done and helps us to give helps to give us faith and strength to endure our present difficulties. One of the ways I found to praise the Lord is through songs. It's kind of why I like catchy little songs that, that the praise band sings because then during the week, those phrases come back so that you can listen hear them over and over. And even if you don't sing out loud, sing in your head. Many times there are no words to express the way we feel. But when we sing a song, that expression comes out, which is why we have the book of Psalms. Because many times the writer felt something so deep that they couldn't really say it. So it came out in a song. Sometimes that song may be no more than a slight whisper, but it's there, and it, we can draw strength from it. There is power in praise. Bupe showed us that this morning. And whether we're praising our children or whether we're praising our spouse, workers, God, there is power in praise. As we continue to read through the book of Psalms, I challenge you, look for ways to praise. Find a child and watch the difference that praise makes. Find a cantankerous co-worker. I'm sure nobody has one of those. But find a cantankerous co-worker and find something to praise them for. And watch the way that it turns things around. Just a little praise. and find ways that we can praise God. Amen? Father, thank you. Thank you that you never change. Thank you that you've given us so many beautiful examples for us to bring to mind. Thank you, Father, that we can purposefully remember. Thank you, Father, that our brains are so constructed that Three things cannot go on in our brains at the same time. So when we're praising you, it blocks out the other. So Father, give us strength and courage.
to praise you this week. Whatever happens in this great city, whatever happens in our lives, may we find time and ways to praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So what are you going to do this week? We are going to find ways to praise. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about how you react to people. Are you a reactor? Do you tend to, Ooh, why did they do that? Or do you think, hmm, wonder why they did that? Whether you give praise or put down, well, let's see. Why don't we plan to shift our position and learn to praise? Secondly, I want you to think about three people. Now, I've heard some of you talk about cantankerous coworkers, so I know that they do exist. But I want you to think about three people, and I want you to find some way that you can praise them this week. Now, you might have to pray hard for the Holy Spirit to show you but you can find something, so find something to praise. Third, every day think about how you can praise others. And fourth, every day plan to give praise to God because that will give you strength and courage to do the rest. Who's having fun with this thing? So think about your own life. How do you react? Secondly, find three people that you can praise. Third, plan to praise every day. And most importantly, praise God every day. Go and have a praise-filled week in Dar es Salaam. God bless you. Thank you.